Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining me from, I am so thankful that you are. My name is Bart Seaver, I'm a chef, author, proud resident of the Jagged Ragged, delicious coast of Maine, from where I am joining you today from my home kitchen. As I said, I really appreciate you joining me and I appreciate you being part of the Ruby family. With that, I always like to say thank you to the Ruby family of folks that help bring these to you, especially Patrick, who is behind the scenes here, allowing these uh, all of these live events to happen. He's a good friend, a trusted colleague, and, well, I appreciate him. And any of you who have joined me before know that I like to talk about gratitude when we start these things off, because cooking is an act of love. It is something that we do in appreciation and in the care of others. And the world needs a lot more of that these days now, doesn't it, right? So to me, the most important uh, ingredient in any recipe is gratitude. So I like to start off with something that I am grateful for, and I hope that you will take some time to reflect the same in your life. And today I am grateful for being at home. I just had uh, the first bit of travel that I've had uh, since uh, this whole COVID era began, and let me tell you, I am happy, very happy to be home. It was a haggering uh, experience, and yeah, for the love of family and the presence of loved ones and just being where we should be, it's a wonderful thing, and I hope that wherever you are, very safe and happy and delicious and sane and sanitized and just all the things that should be, so... I'm grateful for you, and I'm grateful to be here with you. So, all right, question and answer day. Whatever the questions are, maybe I'll have an answer for them, but please throw in anything you got, whether it's tilapia or unicorn farming or aguafaba, whatever it is, or anything, really. The uh, the way that today's going to go is just to the right of me on your screen there, you see this questions where there's the question box. You can type in your question. Also, if there's a question that's been asked already that is particularly relevant to you, hey, just click that little heart icon next to it and boop, 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 boop. it'll vote on up the list to make sure that I get to it. Today, I've got a pretty uh, hard out today, right around three o'clock my time. So we've got just about an hour or so. Hey, let's dive in. Thanks for all the great questions thus far, and please send them along. All right, from Cynthia. Hi, friends. How often do professional chefs sharpen the knives they use at home? So is this uh, how often do they do it or how often do they wish that they do it? Um, the bottom line is uh, I don't think that knives are ever really sharpened as often as they should be. Uh, in my home, I try to sharpen them once a month or so. Uh, I am using them for my my own purposes. I am not opening metal cans with them. I'm taking good care of them is what I'm saying by virtue of that. Uh, yes, every now and then my five-year-old is invited up onto the counter and he bangs around with it. And, you know, there's some dings in it. So I try and do about once a month. Um, and I found that that is adequate. I also, I also have a lot of knives. Uh, so, but here's the thing. How often should you or how often should chefs do it? Uh, don't wait until they're noticeably dull. You know what? Just put yourself in a pattern of every other week or so. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's a nice meditative moment uh, to take for yourself. It's something that you do in advance of cooking the next time, uh, which I find, uh, you know, just like mise en place and starting with a clean kitchen when you cook, right? You should start with clean, with uh with sharpened knives. So when I do sharpen my knives, it's often at the end of a meal after I've done dishes. And well, that's when I have time to just sit and think about something or meditate on whatever it is that I, I want to think about and just sharpen the knives, right? And then put them away. And then the next meal, if you pull them out, there they go. And if you're doing it every two weeks or so, you're not going to go so dull in between unless you're cooking for hundreds of people out of your home. Uh, but also, it's not going to become a burden to you. And that's the thing is repetition and pattern and um, ritual in kitchens like everything else is very important. So if you set yourself on that schedule and keep to it, um, you're going to be best off. So there you go. I hope that helps. But really, it's it's all about the use of your knives. So say if you have a cleaver that you use five times a year, obviously you don't need to sharpen it every other week if you haven't touched it since you last sharpened it. So there you go. Hey, Cynthia, thanks for your question. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you. All right. 
Jeff Barton, can you please recommend cookbooks that will assist us with this course? Uh, and this course being the pro development course, I believe that you're uh, enrolled in there. More knowledge on, uh, uh, more on the knowledge side than about recipes. Thank you. Okay, sure. So the recipes that are in pro development cookbooks like that one, that from the Culinary Institute of America are very helpful in that they are so developed for the purpose of knowledge transfer. This is not about creativity. It's not about teaching a trend or a cuisine so much as it's really about that knowledge base of technique. So I recommend those that even though they are recipes, uh, they are still very much, they're recipes that matter to the education. So um, that the other one that I would absolutely recommend is Harold McGee's Essential on food and cooking. And this is a book all about science. This is all about the science of food, why things happen the way they do. It's a pretty dense read. But it's also built so that you can dive into it and you can you can knock into a certain topic. Um, and I think that that really makes sense to know, to understand what caramelization really is, to understand what an emulsion really is, a colloidal suspension between a like and a dislike phase, right? Hey, I can throw out some heavy chemistry terms for you there, yes, but it is important for you to know. So on Food and Cooking by Harold McGee, um, any of the pro development, uh, the the pro chef cookbooks from CIA are really great. That's the education that I came up in. Um, hey, you could also check out my books. Um, one of my books called Two If by Sea, which is a seafood cookbook, but seafood being uh, an essential part of a cook's literacy. Uh, Two If by Sea is a bit of a creative book, but it's also very technique driven, uh, really understanding seafood as a category. Uh, and then other books that I would recommend or find books uh, if there's a particular cuisine you're interested in, uh, say French cuisine uh, or Italian cuisine, as I is particularly passionate uh, interest for me. Uh, there's some find books on the culture of cuisine because that that matters so so much. Yes, you can learn how to saute, but to understand that but why saute exists and in the role that that technique has played, but also in the flavor components, the way that dishes are constructed in various cuisines, I think is a very important thing to understand. Uh, because also a recipe is not just, it's, yes, it's, there's science to it, right? You want this much tomato and this much sweet to go into your tomato sauce so that the acid and the sweet are balanced and that's right. But understanding the culture, of what tomatoes are in Italy, but why they matter, how they were introduced, how they're grown, how they are preserved by families during the abundance of the late summer season. That's important because that tells you as to the, the very construction of why tomato sauce matters and really kind of what you're looking to accomplish with it, right? So I think that, I think that in addition to the technical aspects of knowing how to cook, Knowing why you're cooking and what you're cooking is very important. So always look for that cultural aspect as well. Hey, hope that helps. Great question. All right. Uh, from John, here in Ontario, Canada, watching from my culinary class, we love to know why you became a chef and what inspired me. All right. Well, thank you for that. So getting right back to my last answer. Cuisine, culture. Um, I was born and raised in a very multi-ethnic immigrant neighborhood in Washington, D.C. A lot of Eritrean and Ethiopian families, a lot of El Salvadorian, Andorian, Guatemalan families, a lot of black families from uh, from the traditional population of Washington, D.C. And that's who I lived amongst. And each of these communities had little bodegas, little stores which service sort of their unique cultural needs. And so food was always this deep sense of exploration for me. Uh, when I went over to my friend's houses for dinner, it was like, whoa, what is that? I, just Things that were way outside of the canon of uh, American cuisine, especially at that time. Um, and so it just, it was so interesting to me. It was a great lens 
through which to see the world and to explore and to understand people and community and history and all these things. So when I was a young man and I, I graduated high school and I didn't have uh, a path at that time, uh, well, cooking was was an obvious uh, platform or sort of an obvious place to put my energies. You know, I liked the energy of a kitchen. I liked uh, the rush of it. I liked the adrenaline of it. Uh, but I also liked that, well, it was, I understood food before I understood cooking, if that makes sense to you. Uh, I understood what food means to people, why it means something to people, and the power of it. And so learning how to cook, as I did also by my father's side, who was sort of the short order family cook, he made dinner most nights a week. Uh, learning how to cook became this wonderful skill that opened up what I already knew and what I was already passionate about just to so many new avenues. <coughs> Excuse me. And so in that way, uh, that's what inspired me to become a chef was the understanding that food is this means to translate so much of our world uh, to make sense of it. But also that I realized that through food, I really cared about people and I cared about feeding people. Um, and then the, the core, sort of course of my career became sustainability because through food, we also care about our environment. And we care about the men and women that produce food, the people who come to a chef's back door that sustain us with the ingredients that without which we wouldn't have a job, right? Hey, no tomatoes, no tomato sauce, no farmers, no tomatoes, no healthy planet, no tomatoes, no farmers, no chefs, right? So there you go. So really understanding that whole lineage of linking back my efforts and my work back to the land uh, became the hallmark of what I've done in my career uh, and the passion that drove me into restaurants, through restaurants, but then also out of restaurants, past them uh, into other chapters of my career, uh, among which I was an explorer for the National Geographic Society for many years, um, and uh, then into public health, where I was the director of the Health and Sustainable Food Program at Harvard University School of Public Health for six years. Um, so what inspired me to be a chef? Uh, well, I hope it's the same things that inspire you to be a chef and to keep growing and to learning. And that is that food is everything about us, about the human experience. It is a window through which we can look on our world and begin to understand any aspect of the human condition that we want to. And so thank you for asking me about my path, but I hope that a little learning a little bit about my path helps you to understand that food is an endless set of opportunities. So while I think everybody should work in restaurants and consider that path and learn that learn those ropes and understand that uh, aspect of the food industry, please also see that food is just about the biggest human concern there is. And so through the skills that you are gaining, even here today, even right now with these ideas, um, please see that the world is truly wide open for you. And I appreciate you and I appreciate you uh, and what you're learning and the passion you're bringing to this. So, hey, thanks for asking about me. I appreciate that. And uh, cool. I hope it helps. All right. From Laura. Hey, Martin, when using onions to prepare a dish that you create, no recipe, okay, how do you know which variety between red, yellow, white, sweet, and shallots work pairs best with other ingredients? Are there any guidelines in this regard? Hey, great question. Okay. All right. So very often, uh, I do not cook from a recipe. So uh, as I think a lot of home cooks don't, or at least they, they get to a point after which they don't use recipes. So let's talk about uh, let's just talk about the different categories of onions first. Uh, so shallots, shallots are elegant. They are small, right? Uh, they are crunchy. They are uh, beautiful in their color and presentation. Let's talk about why each of those things matter. Small. Hey, if you're cooking for two people or four people, um, 
Yeah, well, onions can, you know, sometimes you can get small ones, right? Yellow onions or white onions, but oftentimes you're getting, a, you know, a fist or a softball of an onion, right? So, yeah, cooking for four people, you rarely are going to need a softball size of onion. Shallots, to me, I use them in my house simply just because of the size oftentimes, right? There you go. Because um, one regular size shallot usually fits the bill. Whether I'm starting a tomato sauce, fine, I'll use two shallots. Uh, well, me shallot, I can get that sweet, soft, beguiling uh, texture, but also that sweetness that you're looking for if you're starting like a braise, right? I can get that. I can get the spiciness out of a shallot that you get from a raw onion, but it's actually very elegant. So I can use shallots for salad dressings or sh shave them very thin and put them into the salad itself. Um, and I can get that sort of spiciness from it if I just want a quick saute. So shallots to me are the most versatile of all of the onions and what I use most in my home kitchen. Uh, white onions, you know what? I tend not to use white onions much. I think that they uh, have sort of the least of flavor. Um, not the least of flavor, but the uh, I think they're the most monochromatic, if you will, of, of all of the onions. Uh, and they're, they're delicious in salads. They have the least spice of all of the onions that I've found, uh, that sort of sulfuric acidity that gets you in the back of your throat a little bit and sometimes up in your nose that, that you don't want. That's when they're old. Um, so white onions, I don't use a whole lot of yellow onion is the workhorse of sort of bigger recipes. So if I'm making a tomato sauce, I'll use yellow onion. If I'm making a beef stew, I'll use yellow onion. If I'm making a uh, tofu green curry, I will use yellow onion. Why? Well, Typically, it's the right size for a batch of sauce that I'm making. It's easier to work with because you can just chunk it up and saute it. It's easy. Plus, also from an expense standpoint, they're very, very cheap. 19 cents a pound or something like that. I, um, so yellow onion to me is sort of the workhorse, the backbone onion of sauces. Red onions to me are a ingredient. One that I use very, very often. I happen to absolutely adore red onions, and I think they're one of the greatest ingredients. Uh, however, red onions lose their color when you cook them in things. Do they stay dark? Yes, but they end up looking kind of wormy, just to be honest about it. If you slice them thin and saute them and mix them in with so zucchini or something, they, they just get kind of brown and a little bit wormy looking. So very unattractive there. However, when onions, red onions are cooked very briefly on very, very high heat, really charring them, uh, they have the highest degree, a huge high degree of sugar to them. And that flavor develops in such a way. It is so beautiful. And I love to, to leave some of that smoky singe char on them, but also to leave just a little bit of that crunchy texture to it and fold them in that way to dishes, uh, whether it's a salad of mint and cilantro leaves, lime juice that I toss with shrimp right off the grill, or just mix up as a salad just like that, maybe a little fish sauce uh, and peanut oil or something, and throw it on just as a salad next to a piece of grilled salmon, whatever it is. Uh, red onions are magical in that way, in that they're one of the most balanced of all flavors that I use. Uh, but they're not good necessarily sautéed into things or used as a base because of that color loss. And sweet onions? Sweet onions to me are an ingredient in and of themselves. I don't use them as part of other dishes so much as I use them as they are for being themselves. Um, there's a great Spanish tapa uh, that I, I love to make, which is just roasted thick steaks of uh, sweet onions, whether it's Maui Maui, Vidalia, Sweet 100s, or uh, that's a kind of tomato, um, Walla Walla onions, any of those sweet ones, um, big thick steaks, roast them off at a very high heat until they're caramelized and sitting in their own caramelized onion juices and they're delicious. Make a vinaigrette out of Cabrales cheese. It's a beautiful, wonderful, stinky blue cheese. Um, a little bit of sherry vinegar and olive oil and throw that on top. Ooh, man, that is so delicious. But those onions, the sweet onions, I use specifically for their sweetness. Uh, and very rarely would I use them in any dish. They're too sweet for a tomato sauce, in my opinion. 
They would overpower or stand out if you were making otherwise a stew or a curry sauce, something like that. You're just, there's so much sugar. There's as much sugar in a sweet onion as there is in an apple. Um, so just think about that level. So anyway, there's a dissertation on onions. I hope that helps. And that's a great question. So thank you. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, from Louis. Hey, buddy. Louis. Uh when making cashew bechamel, could I get the same result with using cashew milk instead of soaking cashews in water for many hours? Uh, yes, absolutely. You can get you can get that same texture. Uh, you're just not going to get the same um, sort of depth of flavor. I think. Uh, actually, you know what? No, I think I, I think it's going to be just fine. So yeah, go ahead and make that swap. There you go. Cheers. Easy question. Thanks, buddy. All right, from Daniel. Hi, friend. Uh, I can whip aquafaba until it's fluffy. Fluffy. Aquafaba being the liquid that comes out of the can uh, with chickpeas or the cooking liquid from cooking your own. Any idea how I can color it so it looks ocean or azure blue? What interesting question. And I'm curious as to know why you would want to do that. If you would, hey, Daniel. Uh, yeah, Daniel, throw that question Throw that answer in there. I'd love to hear what you're what you're aiming for. That that sounds like a lot of fun in the presentation. Um, blue is a color that uh, occurs very rarely in food. I think blueberry. That's it. Blueberries really are more purple once you get down to it. Those anthocyanins in there. Um, so the only way to get blue is to use food coloring, uh, and you're just going to have to mess around with that until you find the right. Uh, combination, but I would imagine it's really going to take very, very little blue food coloring uh, to get you to that uh, color combo that you're looking for. But again, curious to hear what you're up to with that, so please share with us if you are so willing. Thanks, Daniel. All right, from Lynn. Hey, what are sustainable seafood innovations? And at the same time, being mindful of food that sharks and whales, seals, top-level predators depend on. All right. So, sustainable seafood innovations. Uh, sustainable seafood being, let's just explain what that is, uh, seafood that can be harvested or farmed now uh, in ways that support communities and provide healthful food for people, uh, but also that are harvested or farmed in ways that uh, can endure so that those communities can stay in place, the ecosystems can stay resilient and healthy, for just being ecosystems, not just in service to people, uh, and also that the economies of them can endure. So sustainable seafood is basically enduring people within a thriving, resilient ecosystem. So innovations. Well, innovations in sustainable seafood, one of which would be simply, I think that humans, uh, especially in America, uh, where I'm based and my work is focused, uh, should eat more seafood. Uh, and that's because, well, seafood as a center of the plate animal protein uh, is the most sustainable of the animal proteins. Now, we should be eating a veg-centric diet, absolutely every one of us across the board, to what degree that is up to you. But if you are going to be eating animal proteins of any sort, I think that seafood should be one of the highest amounts of those that we eat. The reasons why is, well, they're just inherently more sustainable uh, because of the environments in which they are grown. You and me and pigs and chickens and everything else were fighting gravity and growing bones to fight atmospheric pressure and spending a lot of energy keeping our blood warm and a lot of energy in our brains warm. Uh, we grow a lot of connective tissue just in order to be able to move around. Fish? No. Nah. Hey, dude. I just float. They live in a boy. Excuse me. They live in a buoyant environment that uh, just makes them biologically more efficient. So when it comes to carbon, uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, when it comes to, <laughs> excuse me, I ate some very spicy peppers for lunch, uh, land use alterations, uh, meaning how much land is plowed under in order to farm that fish, very little. Uh, when it comes to feed conversion ratio, how much food going in to food coming out, uh, when it comes to antibiotic use and others, uh, seafood is really sort of the best animal protein choice we can make. And when it comes to our personal health, the acute nutrition aspects, uh, in America, our diet is killing us. 
uh, in many other places in the planet as well. And seafood as part of a healthy, nutritious diet is been proven over and over again to be one of the very best dietary uh, components we can have. Now, I know that a lot of you on this uh, event here are uh, whole food plant-based diet, and I recommend that fully as well um, and salute you for all that you are doing for your health and that of the planet and for your family. Um, so I am not arguing against that in any way. Uh, but seafood, I think the innovation that you asked after, one of the innovations is simply for us to eat more seafood and less red meat and less other land animal proteins. Other innovations would be for us to really focus our diets around farm-raised shellfish, so clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, and the attendant kelp, and other seaweeds that can be grown with them. Uh, many of these species have been proven that they can be carbon negative, in fact, can act as a sink for carbon, uh, excess carbon in the atmosphere that is causing climate change amongst other gases. So uh, it's also a means to create new economic opportunity and stewardship of environments along the coast. Uh, so eating more shell, farm-raised shellfish is to me a big innovation that we can do. And when it talks to innovation in just like food, hey, having menus or having diets or having just a, a weekly menu that we make for ourselves that includes mussels, scallops, clams, oysters is a very good thing. Uh, other innovations that you've uh, looking at are land-based uh, farming systems for seafood. And we're beginning to see some of these come online in places such as Wisconsin and Minnesota and Waterbury, Connecticut, and all over the place. Maine, even, too. Here, this state with the second longest coastline of any in the, in the United States. And we're starting to farm a lot of seafood on land. Why? Uh, because these systems, uh, we're innovating and we're building technology that's allowing us to do so on land in very sustainable ways. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's just a very interesting way to bring food production uh, ever closer to urban centers as well, which is helping to reduce uh, carbon footprint of seafood. So there's a lot of, of neat things that are happening there. And all of this also is sort of overshadowed by your question of while leaving food in the ocean. So sharks and whales and seals and all of the creatures in the ocean that deserve to be in the ocean and that we need there uh, also need food themselves to eat. So when we think about sustainable seafood, we can't just think about it in the vacuum of are there enough sardines in the ocean for us to take 40 of them and for the rest to swim on and for there to be 100 again next year? That's not enough to think. We need to think about the entire ecosystem function of that fish, what other species rely on it, what services those fish give to the ecosystem. Because um, everything in this world has multiple purposes, not just to be eaten, but also to eat and to perform valuable services, etc. I mean, think about a honeybee. A honeybee, their purpose in life is right, just to eat uh, pollen, right? Yes, but they also provide an incredible service to the planet, right? So too does every species in its own way. So yes, you're right. We do need to be mindful that we acknowledge that and account for that. So Anyway, long answer there for a very complicated question, but you also, I think, probably knowingly tapped into, well, what I do, which is sustainable seafood, and I think about this all day and every day. So thank you, Lynn, for the opportunity to talk about that, and I hope that uh, others of you out there uh, got some things to think about around sustainable seafood. I appreciate the question. All right. From, uh, I'm sorry, I have a new computer and my font is set so low that I can't really see the name, so I might get this wrong, but Shireen, I think might be uh, how to pronounce that. What can I use instead of olives for the umami taste task? Um, so uh, Ruby does have a list of the other uh, uh, plant-based sources of umami. Uh, and so if you don't like the olives, please, before you do any of the uh, tasks, please just send an email letting us know uh, what you're thinking to do so that we can make sure that it, it fits that task and that learning uh, appropriately. Um, so I will look for that, that list of the umami, the plant-based umami resource uh, guide for you there. We'll get that over to you. Um, but anytime that you're shifting up any of the tasks, which is, which is totally fine to do to an extent, just make sure that you 
acknowledge it to us ahead of time so that we can make sure that that fits the learning goal of it, just so you don't have to do it twice. So we certainly don't want you eating olives if you just don't like using them or can't eat them for any reason. Uh, but we do we just want to make sure that the learning is intact. So, all right, Serene, thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, uh, from Laura. Hey there. To make a tomato sauce using fresh tomatoes, which variety would you recommend in order to ensure that the sauce is sweet enough without using a sweetener to balance the acidity of the tomatoes? And which type of tomato is generally best for which dish? Huh. Interesting question. Well, there's only several thousand varieties of tomatoes, so we can get through this in the next two days. Um, yeah, let's let's dive in, Laura. Cool. I'm just kidding. Um, so the very best uh, tomatoes for sauces to me are the paste tomato category. So this is the plum tomato, uh, the Amish tomato, the San Marzano tomato, etc. Um, the reason for that is that the the skins are all easily removed. You don't want skins in sauce. Uh, the flesh tends to be very thick uh, and doesn't hold a huge amount of water in there. So you don't want a watery sauce. You want a tomatoey sauce, right? So the ratio of water to sort of flesh, the pulp of the tomato is is low there. Uh, there's a relatively low number of seeds in that category of tomato, the plum tomato, San Marzano, uh, et cetera. Um, they also tend to ripen. Uh, they grow uh, just prolifically. Uh, and so you can get a whole lot of them if you're growing them uh, yourself or if, at market, if you're buying them, they're, they're relatively inexpensive um, because the plants are so productive, as well as they're hardy in that they... H-A-R-D-Y, in that they can make it to market. They don't bruise very easily and lose their appeal uh, or go bad. So there's a lot of factors recommending them to be the sauce tomato category. Uh, amongst those, San Marzano's to me uh, are, are key. I, I use a lot of canned tomatoes, uh, and I do make sure I, I use canned tomatoes from Italy uh, that are protected status of origin. Uh, San Marzano's, they just have a really delicious flavor, uh, but also you're you're sure of what you are getting. You're talking about a fresh tomato sauce, so there are those uh, recommendations. In terms of how to get the sweetness in there, uh, you don't necessarily have to add a sweetener uh, in the form of sugar. What I often do is start with onion, uh, which is traditional to, you know, Everybody has their own tomato sauce recipe. Some include onions, some don't. Uh, but onions add that sweetness to the uh, dish that you might be looking for. Uh, the other thing to do, and a friend of mine, Domenica Marchetti, uh, an incredible Italian cook and educator, culinary educator, uh, who joined us at an event, uh, first around the table event here on Ruby. Please go back and check her, check out that event in the archive. Maybe Patrick, you could pull this up. Um, and put, put the link up there for us. But um, she has a suggestion in one of her books in which she says that an old Italian grandmother once taught her to put a carrot into the sauce. So this is just a raw carrot, maybe chunked in half or so, and just put it into the sauce to simmer. And that actually can add enough sweetness uh, to balance out the acidity that's so inherent in tomatoes. Uh, another thing that you could do here is to add a super sweet tomato such as a Sun Gold tomato or a Sweet 100, any of the cherry tomatoes that have uh, recently come onto the market and gained quite vogue status. Uh, there's a huge amount of sugar in those. There's also a high amount of skin to flesh ratio, so I wouldn't use a whole lot of them. Uh, it's quite a, quite a process to skin cherry tomatoes in volume, uh, but a few of those mixed into a, into a plum tomato sauce uh, would be wonderful. Uh, and otherwise, Laura, what are the generally best for which dish? Um, you know, all tomatoes are good, in my opinion. Um, crunchy, striped green zebra tomatoes, uh, German tomatoes, some of the ones that are hard, even when they are ripe and crunchy. Obviously, those are going to be best maybe used in a ceviche or as a garnish to a salad. 
the big slicing varieties like Cherokee purple, uh, brandy wines, the big yellow, you know, mortgage lifters or the, the big yellow ones, and early girls, things like that. Uh, all these heirloom tomato varieties, those are going to be best just with the core hollowed out and then sliced thick and put on a plate and just garnished with whatever you want. Cherry tomatoes to me, uh, I really love using cherry tomatoes to make the sauce for other tomatoes. I take some old tomatoes, I cut them in half, take a little bit of garlic on a microplane, put it all in a Tupperware, salt, olive oil, put the Tupper, top, top of the Tupperware on and just shake it. And only as vigorously as you can shake with your hands and the whole thing breaks up into this wonderful emulsified sauce and you just spoon that right over top. It's got bright acidity, it's got that salinity, it's got also that beautiful color, that yellowish gold on top of red sliced tomatoes. And here you go. So now you begin to start seeing that tomatoes, there's a lot of variables here. And a lot of it is, what do I want my dish to look like? Where is the acid going to come from? Where is the bulk going to come from? Where is the sweetness? So uh, no tomato is a bad tomato. So here's the other thing. Just test it out. Figure it out what's best and, uh, and go with it. Hey, great question. Thank you so much. Patrick, thank you for throwing up that link. There you go. It is up in the top of the columns there. Uh, Domenica Marchetti's live event. Back, back number 725. All right. Uh, from Kathleen. Wow, we got a bunch of questions. I will endeavor to hurry up my answers to get to them. Did you see the documentary See Spiracy? And if so, what are my thoughts about it? Wow. Okay. Um, not sure I can give a quick answer to that one. So, uh, Seaspiracy is a documentary that came out uh, several months ago, I believe February maybe, and it is a takedown of the seafood industry. It is politicized, it is polarized, uh, and does not offer an accurate accounting of even the information that it itself uh, gives. Uh, Seaspiracy is a deeply, deeply flawed movie. Uh, it is a deeply flawed and, I think, unethical piece of journalism. Um, that not to say that some of the things in there are not true. But C. Spearsby takes a, some truths and presents them out of context and, in fact, then outright lies about some of them. Uh, and in the end, the, the result is BS. Um, it is a very good example of how truths taken out of context to become BS. Uh, you can see I'm using very sort of strong language around this because, well, it should have done better. It's a giant disservice that that movie did uh, in that it takes legitimate issues, things that we really do need to be paying attention to, things that we absolutely do need to be working together to fix, and it presents them as an all-or-nothing zero-sum game uh, and its ultimate takeaway is don't eat seafood at all. And in such, it becomes a stark advocacy piece that outright lies to the viewers. Um, so that's my take on Seaspiracy. Seaspiracy. Uh, I could provide maybe some other links to you. I, I've done a couple of, of webinars and other things about this, talking about some specific points in there. But um, yes. There you go. I will, uh, you know what, I think we'll, we'll have your email, yes, because you signed up for this course, so I'll look around for some uh, articles on that and send them along. So there's a lot to discuss there. I'm not just outright dismissing the, uh, the topics discussed in that movie. I am dismissing the movie itself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from Bob. Hi, we are on a very low sodium diet. We use uh, my salt as a substitute for flavoring. It's made from potassium chloride and lysine. Interesting. I've not heard of this. Besides taste, salt is used as a chemical component. Is there any chemistry that we are missing? Hmm. I am not qualified to answer this really fascinating, interesting, amazing question. Um, my chemistry knowledge does not go deep enough into the chemical effects of NaCl as well as potassium chlorides and others in order to know how, what they do and what they don't do. Uh, for that, I would recommend you back to a book that I mentioned at the end of this, um, which was Harold McGee's On Food and Cooking. 
Uh, it is a brilliant, brilliant book that if you are interested in the chemistry of salt, you'll probably be interested in a lot of the other chemistry that is discussed in this book. Um, and I believe also if you if you look some of this up online, um, uh, Food Lab, I believe also, Jay Kenzie uh, Lopez, uh, Alt Lopez, uh, has some great work on this as well. Um, but I'm sorry that I, I would only fib my way through an answer here. But great question. And I hope those resources do provide uh, the answer you're looking for. Hey, thanks, Bob. Appreciate you joining us today. From Terry Lynn, hi, what are your thoughts about hiring consultants to help start a business? <laughs> I love the breadth of questions today. I want to open a gluten-free vegan kitchen. It's easy to find vegan. It's easy to find gluten-free, but finding both together is not. Any advice? Um, well, you know, if you are um, thinking about hiring a consultant, uh, that is A, showing me, showing me two things. A, that you are very much in the right mindset with the humility of acknowledging what you don't know, which as a business owner is absolutely fundamental and the key to success. So if you're thinking about hiring a consultant for that, um, absolutely, then that is, is the right way to go. Uh, there are, yes, and there are very knowledgeable people out there who do um, that very thing uh, and can really put you uh, sort of on the track that you need to to be on. I, I don't know any of those folks specifically off the top of my head in order to recommend them to you. Um, but uh, do I think that uh, your idea in general is a good one? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I think that you know, more and more so those ideas, uh, because those communities, I think, are coming together closer and closer in terms of just cuisines, uh, but also uh, just, you know, knowing what I know about the sort of the culinary education process that gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian uh, sort of constructions of dishes, as well as just even looking at menuing, uh, there's a greater importance placed on it now just in culinary education, as well as in sustainability principles that are guiding large-scale food service. So, you are going to see a lot more of it. I think there's plenty of it out there now. If you if you look around in various communities, likely urban centers, um, but hey, every great concept needs a pioneer. So Terry Lynn, be that pioneer. Show it. Show the world what you can do. I love it. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate you. All right, from Amelia, how to work with a bread recipe that calls for instant dry yeast? And I have instant yeast, huh? Um, those two things are, are uh, compatible. Absolutely. I, uh, I am not a baker. That is not my specialty. So I would not know the quantities to tell you to use, but that is a, uh, that is uh, a thing that you can Google fairly easily and find out uh, a good answer to. Um, and that is information that I would tend to actually trust the internet to get right. Um, so I'm sorry that I cannot tell you, but, um, search it out if the New York times, uh, cooking, uh, has something on that, um, uh, would be one source to go to. Uh, I don't really even look at baking recipes, uh, bread baking either. So I, I can't even tell you which direction to go there, but New York times I know does uh, talk about some of that, that sort of technicality stuff, uh, and do it well. So I would start there, uh, but also Google is going to be your friend here. So sorry, I can't help. Wish you well, and thanks for joining us. All right. Blueberries. Terry Lynn, hey, friend, are in season. Yes, they are. What are you making with them? What are we making with them? Well, uh, our blueberry season up here ended a few weeks back, but we took our, our one-year-old and our five-year-old out, and we picked um, wow, about six gallons of blueberries, I think, this year. We came home and made a whole bunch of jam, but I also, we just freeze them. Uh, we put them on sheet trays uh, individually, like marbles, and freeze them in the freezer uh, as such. And then we have nibble food for the kiddos. Uh, so we have frozen blueberries straight out of the freezer all year round. That's what we do with them. I love me a blueberry pie. Uh, it's one of the things that I, my mom used to make that I really, really loved and it sort of carried with me. Um but other than that, uh, I like to throw them on salads. So I love an arugula salad with a lot of blueberries in it. Uh, arugula, that peppery, spicy bite to it. 
Um, and then I throw mint in there. Mint, yes, mint. Mint is an ingredient that any of you have joined me before on these episodes uh, know that I love. And I love putting mint in just about everything. Uh, that is how it should be used. Uh, biologically, it's how you have to use it. If you have any of it on your property, you know that the only way to control it is to use it um, or else it will take over. Um, but uh, so uh, arugula, mint, maybe a little shaved fennel in there for a little texture or shaved shallot, very, very thinly shaved shallot or red onion, getting back to the question earlier about onions, uh, and then blueberries. So you've got this mixture of spice, of aromatic, of blueberry, and then just a simple lemon vinaigrette over the top to add just that acidity to it. You've got a really wonderful, wonderful dish. Super helpful as well. So there's just one idea. I hope that helps. Thanks, Dan. All right, from Sonu. Uh, Sonu, excuse me, I don't, forgive my present uh, pronunciation in there. What are the recommended knives to buy? Uh, well, for the course, if that's what you're talking about, uh, recommend would just be a knives that you already know how to work with. If that's what you've got and you already have some fluency, stick with that. But just a 10 inch chef's knife uh, to me is the uh, is really what you need. A 10 inch chef's knife, a paring knife and a bread knife uh, in my kitchen. I have a lot of knives, but if I could only have three, it would be those three uh, just because they each perform uh, either every task, such as the tenon chef's knife or the paring knife or the bread knife. When you really need a bread knife, you need a bread knife. It is the safest way to cut bread. It is the easiest way to cut bread. It is also the most accurate way to cut bread so that you don't end up with, so you end up with straight slices um, and not mangling the bread or crushing it, et cetera, in the cutting process. So those are the three that I recommend, uh, but check out the Ruby course for their, also for their formal recommendations. Hope that helps. Hey, thanks. Appreciate you. All right. From Carissa. Hi there. What would you recommend? Oh, questions are dancing around. What would you recommend buying a knife set or getting them individually instead? Um, you can save some money by buying a knife set. Yes. But also what is money saved if you spend more to get knives that you're not going to ultimately use? Um, I don't really buy knife sets because of that, because... You know, I, my paring knife, I use so often that quite honestly, I'm going to replace my paring knife a little, I, I've replaced paring knife twice in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the tenant chef's knife that I use, I haven't replaced yet. Um, so in that way, I've always thought that just buying the individual knives that you like are best. Uh, Cause quite honestly, if you're buying the, the beautiful Wusthof 10 inch chef's knife that has the perfect rock and the grip on the handle for you and the tang is perfect and just allows you to really be comfortable, well, yeah, but then the paring knife is of a shape that you don't particularly like, well, you're stuck with it, right? Buy each individual knife individually is my, my advice. I understand the value in buying sets, um, but... Uh, I've also been using knives long enough and I cook so much that I do, I have developed preferences for say, these are just three of the pairing knives that I have, right? Here's one style. Yeah. Okay. Here's another style, flatter and longer. And then here's another style round and sort of rocker, right? So these are all three very different knives. And if your set comes with just one of these, well, it, might not be the one that you ultimately prefer. Why do I have so many of these? Because I've been given them over the years for various reasons. Um, it's ridiculous to have three pairing knives. And in fact, I've given away probably eight of them to, uh, uh, to Syrian refugee families that are being resettled in Maine recently uh, through Catholic charities. So um, yeah, anyway, long answer. There you go. But um, bye individually. Bye. Ooh, that was a long answer. Oh, wait. Sorry. Hey there. How do you persuade vegetarians and vegans that you can make great plant-based vegan food when you are not vegan or vegetarian? <laughs> um, the proof is in the vegan pudding. You like that? Yeah. Um, so that's an American... American colloquialism right there to say that, you know, basically the, the proof is in the food. Uh, don't try and convince them. Just do it, right? 
there you go. Invite them over for dinner. Tell them you're going to respect them by respecting their dietary choices and then just put it on the table and wow them. There you go. That's the way to do it. Um, but it is true that a lot of people, I think it's it's oftentimes the other way. It's that non-vegetarians, vegans need to be convinced that vegan vegetarian food can be delicious, which is an utterly ridiculous stand, standpoint to, to have. Um, that vegetable cuisine can be delicious is duh, the most obvious thing there is. Anyway, um, invite them over for dinner. There you go. All right, from Angie, what are the best plant proteins to serve my son so he gets uh, plenty of nutritional foods? Uh, a variety is the answer there. Uh, as with any diet, uh, serving one thing is, even if it's nutrient, nutrient dense, is not the answer. Uh, just eating hang, hang, my son calls them hanger burgers, so... Just eating hamburgers is not going to keep you healthy, despite the fact that it might be might have protein and nutrition in it. It's arguable, right? So really, it's a blend. It's grains and greens and vegetables and pulses and legumes, and it's a diversity in the diet, which makes cooking harder. It makes your pantry bigger, yes, but ultimately it makes eating better. And if you're really looking for nutrition, nutrition comes from diversity. The health of any system is based on diversity, um, whether that's our bodies and what we put into it, whether that's economic, whether it's social, whether it's cultural, whether it's just uh, so look for a diversity of things. But obviously, those nutrient dense plant foods like quinoa and amaranth and spelt and, um, and others, uh, as well as just a whole host of colorful stuff. But that is the basis of Ives course, uh, teaching those uh, fundamental fluencies, but also the techniques to make them delicious. So I hope that helps. And I appreciate your journey that you are on because cooking for other people is an act of love. And obviously we all love our children and it is very clear that you love yours. So thanks for that. The world needs more of it. Appreciate what you're doing. Marco. Hey buddy. I've been enjoying your seafood literacy course. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you joining us there. Live near the coast in Central America and want to experiment with local ingredients. Cool. How do you come up with new dishes? What steps do I go through? And what are your criteria for a great dish? Wow. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. How many days you got, Marco? Hmm. Great question, though. So uh, my criteria for a great dish is did I enjoy it? Did it fit the purpose or the mood, right? Uh Yes, there are great dishes that stand alone in the canon of culinary and time um, that anybody can look at and be like, wow, that is just really, that's, that's good. Like um, cedar planked salmon, uh, you know, just, or, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, wow, I'm blanking on seafood dishes. That's weird. Uh, or bouillabaisse. You know, I mean, these are dishes that stand the test of time and the canon of that. But you know what? Uh, yes, so it's a great dish, but it is the right dish for now. Uh, you're in Central America, and it's early September, and uh, I'll bet you it's pretty warm where you are. Do you really want a big, thick, heavy stew of seafood? Well, yeah, so your big, thick, heavy stew of seafood, your bouillabaisse, even though it's a great dish, isn't the right dish, right? So seasonally is key to me. Uh, the bottom line is the dish is the sum of all of the ingredients you put into it, not just the culinary creativity. So if you're using tomatoes, but it's February and your tomatoes suck, your dish is not going to be what it could be, right? So uh, when I am coming up with a dish, I am only, I am limiting myself to ingredients that I know are also going to be good. Uh, no dish the sum of ingredients can be no greater than the quality of what you start with. It's just, that's, that's math. Um, and it's also just good cooking science. Uh, but, um, you know, thinking seasonally, uh, also just thinking about where you are, uh, not regionally, but you know, like, is it a hot day? Okay. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for something cool and refreshing. Is it going to be a ceviche, which I'm sure is part uh, or at least familiar to the coastal cuisine where you are? Okay, but, you know, I'm thinking an entree here. 
And ceviche is typically an appetizer. Well, you know what? Okay, so what are the things that you could do to tweak a ceviche to make it an entree? Huh. Maybe it's not just the fish or as in Peru, you know, fish or, or maybe the pozole corn. Huh. Maybe there are some seared red onions in there. Maybe I'm going to mix uh, a little bit of quinoa into it. Maybe I'll put some almonds into my ceviche. And maybe I'll rehydrate some raisins in lime juice. Uh, so I have these punctuations and I have crispy quinoa on top. So, wow, okay, all of a sudden now I'm not just eating eight ounces of, of ceviche. No, I've diversified my ceviche to meet me where I am on this hot day in this region with these products available, right? So to me, that's what a great dish does. It takes all of the cues available to you in that moment and makes the most sense of them. If that, I, I think, offers you a path forward. So it's not necessarily creating some brand new dish, but saying, huh, what are the familiar jumping off points, say a ceviche, that I could use to make what I'm looking for. So I hope that helps there. Uh, again, that is a topic that you could spend literally a career thinking about studying and writing about. Um, but I hope that that little answer uh, helps and gives you a little bit of pathway. But thank you for joining the Secret Literacy course and for us today. Uh, please reach out if there's anything else that I can offer to you, uh, barton at ruby.com. So thanks, friend. Appreciate you. All right, from Mary, I'm slowly upgrading the quality of my kitchen tools, and I have high-quality cookware and knives and a Dutch oven. Do you have any advice on kitchen tools and spending the money for the best quality, considering an immersion blender or food processor? Okay. Um, yeah, well, good for you. And great journey that you're on. And, yes, it does take time. I am still uh, – there's still areas of my kitchen that I would love to upgrade just a little bit here and there. Uh, but I am blessed and fortunate with what I've got. So an immersion blender or a uh, also known stick blender and a uh, traditional upright blender, uh, they are things that I think do the, yes, money, the investment there is worth it. Uh, I've got a, a Vitamix blender and hey, Patrick, I found it today. Aren't you? Look, look at me. Last episode of this I did, I just spun around in circles looking for my Vitamix because somebody put it elsewhere. Anyway, I've, I found it again, but I have this Vitamix. Um, I, I have had a Vitamix for nearly 17 years. The only reason I have this one is because uh, it, it was given to me um, as a gift for doing a, a presentation at the National Restaurant Association. The one that I had before it, I gave to my brother, uh, and he is still using it. And I had opened seven restaurants with that uh, very blender that my brother now has. Um, are they a couple hundred bucks? Yeah, they're expensive. But you know what? If you get 17 years of use out of them and likely a lot more coming down the pike, that's a pretty good investment. Also, did the machine do what I really needed it to do efficiently and to the highest level? Yes, it did, which is why it's still on my counter. Um, so machines like that are worth investing in, yes. Um, an immersion blender is convenient at times when you don't want to do ladle from one to another and then back into another pot. But you know what? To me, that's just the inconvenience of doing another dish, of washing another dish. Um, and an immersion blender can't do everything that a Vitamix or an upright blender or even a Ninja can do. So I think that in that category, if you're looking for just one thing to upgrade right now, I would go with blender uh, first. I do have an immersion blender as well. If I'm making soup for a bunch of people and I've got a big pot of it over there and I just want to blend it all up in one and not well, worry about it. Yes. Uh, I am in a situation where I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford that. Um, uh, and also have the space in my kitchen to do so, uh, to have that. So I have both, but I would recommend the blender first. Uh, and then if you are still seeing that you, you want an immersion blender, I would. Uh, the other thing that I would say is one of the things that people don't invest in, and they should, is uh, utensils and spatulas and things like that. So in my kitchen, I've got – 
I got a whole lot of spatulas. You know why? Because they actually come in useful for many things. And when you're in the heat of cooking something and you've got a whole lot on the stove and you've got a bunch of things going on, you know what? It's, it's helpful just to have one extra of something every now and then, right? So I've got these large spatulas. These are the heat-proof rubber spatulas. I've got a small one. And then I use a lot of wooden tools. And I like these, A, just I love the feel of them. An artisan made each of these by hand, uh, but they don't scratch up my good cookware. It's not a metal spoon or a metal stirrer that's going to, you've made the investment in your cookware, keep your investment by treating it right. Wood. I've got these sort of paddle spatulas like this. I've got a bunch more of them. Yeah, Smaller ones like these. I go on Etsy.com and I buy these. I find some little woodworking crafts person that really likes doing this, little passion projects, and I'm happy to support them. I think these were 11 bucks a piece or something. I get them for myself for Christmas and put them in my stocking. Um, like, it's fun, right? But they're wonderful little tools. So invest also in your utensils just for the sake of your equipment. Uh, if not, just for the ease and versatility of your kitchen. All right, there you go. From Barbara, what material do you recommend for skillet to sear fish on a gas burner and then go into the oven for? Stainless steel with aluminum core, nonstick ceramic, depth of skillet, etc. The weight of cast iron is discouraging you from using it. Okay, so let me show you my pan. Um, but I use this pan more than anything else. So but it comes also with a cloche atop to it of the same material that I don't really use. But what I love about this is that it's fish shaped, it's perfect for gas, and it transitions seamlessly into the oven. It's nonstick, and it's also not the super heavy pan. Yeah, it's a heavy, heavy. Um, but it's not a you know a large cast iron pan that's big and bulky with that handle that you have to hold from here. And yeah, it puts a lot of strain on your elbow. I get it. I get it. I've been holding a child for a year, my my one year old now. Uh, my shoulder hurts and all that. Yeah, I you know what? I don't want to cook with a cast iron skillet anymore. I'm with you. Um, Easily picks up on both sides. Done. And here's the kicker. I don't really use my oven. You know why? So I got a toaster oven. Look at this. I do most of my oven cooking in the toaster oven. So that's why I love that pan. Uh, and the, the sales pitch for the toaster oven is that, A, it's a little more sustainable because I have a lot less area to heat up trying to heat up an entire oven to 350, which is this much space, right? As opposed to heating up that. Use a lot less electricity, use a lot less gas. Well, no gas up here, gas down in the, uh, in the stove, in the oven. So uh, from a sustainability standpoint, but also just from an ease of cooking, it's a lot easier to maintain the exact temperature in a very small environment than it is in a large environment. Just volume is a variable. So... I really like the toaster oven for that purpose. You gotta have a good quality toaster oven. That one, that one only cost about 120 bucks or so. Uh, so I didn't get the super fancy one. But uh, that's the pan that I go. Other than that, though. Uh, to other pans, like sort of hanging pans or pans with a long handle, is that you then have to have space in your oven for the handle too, right? And uh, that's why I love this pan so much. Is it's just right there. It's concise. It's all it needs to be. No additional weight bearing. Okay. Thanks, Melanie. When using a no a no oil saute technique, is it possible to use a nonstick frying pan? Absolutely. Uh, so I've got Misen pans. M I S E N. Uh, it's a nonstick surface, non toxic. Uh, absolutely, that would be. For that, um, the heat transfer is uh, on a good quality nonstick pan is going to be similar to that uh, of a, um, a stainless steel. So the key to that, though, is just don't touch your food. If you're looking to get it brown to get that caramelization on it, don't touch it. Make sure the pan is hot enough when you put it when you before you put the ingredients in, and let the pan do the cooking. You know, it doesn't cook food. Humans, no, we don't. Heat cooks food. 
we're dig your pan into the fire. Don't constantly turn it and saute it. If you're trying to get something caramelized, let the heat thins. Uh, in this case, uh, which are the things that make things red or yellow, orange in color, uh, are subject to light sensitivity uh, and can break down. Um, but also things that are orange and yellow, red in color, just thinking basically all of those are So it be stored in the refrigerator, uh, maybe. Uh, but here's probably a better way to go. Buy them fresh in the quantities that you know that you are going to use relatively quickly. I recommend this for all spices. Don't buy a pound of things at a time unless you're like me and you actually go through a pound of fennel seeds and a pound of bay leaves, which is a lot of bay leaves. Um, buy small quantities of them, use them fresh, and then buy more. So in that way, you're not going to have the product sitting around long enough to the point where any light penetration or heat is really going to be of issue. Keep them out of direct light. Don't put them on a shelf in the sun uh, where they can bake in your home in Arizona. Just don't do that because that will ruin anything and everything. Um, just keep them in a, in a reasonable place, cool, in a cabinet somewhere in your kitchen. Use them frequently. That's the best advice I can give. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you joining me here today. I appreciate that you are interested in cooking and serving up love for others and those in your family and community. So I wish you all the very best. I look forward to having you join again at another time, another event. Keep in touch. Be well. Bye now.